Warning, this video is not for children. You heard the man, it's really not for kids. If you're under 18, you should not be watching this. You have probably fantasized about me. Hello. Hello. How are you going? Good, thank you. How are you? Not bad. Good to finally speak to you face to face. Thank you. Good to speak with you too. I, so your name, just it's just pronounced like Finn? Finn? Like on a fish? Finn? Exactly. Yep. Finn on a fish. Okay. It was sometime in the early 2010s, during my latter high school years, that I discovered the music, world and philosophy of internet vegan activist John Sackars. Sackars was a pretty hardcore proponent of veganism, but also an interesting character in his own right. I was first introduced to John Sackars through his now taken down video titled A Sexy Surprise for Adult Vegans. Oh, you're so beautiful. The video consisted of him pretending to seduce and subsequently perform oral sex on a vegan woman. While I'd normally instruct a viewer to seek out the video themselves for verification, I cannot in good faith do that in this instance, due to the pure level of discomfort such a video seemed to elicit in virtually every single person who saw it. Veganism seemed to be irrelevant to how much someone squirmed at this video. Sakars has created a rarity in the art world, a piece of content that seemed to get identical reactions from people regardless of background. This in itself was not only unusual, but impressive. I decided to follow the metaphorical trail of vegan breadcrumbs and see what else Sakar's channel had to offer. After some perusing and listening, I realized that Sakar's main form of online content was actually music. He currently has over 100 self-produced songs and music videos on his channel. Most of the songs espouse the virtues of veganism one way or the other, while others simply attack non-veganism, or carnism, as immoral, violent and hateful. Political opinions aside, I could tell John Sackars was a man devoted to his message and his work. He seemed to really believe in veganism as a path to a better society, and was trying to convince people in all the ways he knew how. That said, a large number of people were and are put off by his content. Not by the aggressiveness of his message necessarily, but due to the bizarre sexual elements that frequently permeated his videos. That's right, the sexy surprise for adult vegans video was not an isolated case. John spent a lot of his early years on YouTube expressing his sexual desires and frustrations in his vegan activism songs, and often projected extreme confidence and swagger into his music. While I could write a whole lot of jokes making fun of this, I think it's honestly unnecessary to ridicule John's early work because simply watching it achieves the desired effect. Some of John's more famous and musically engaging tunes from his early YouTube career include My crotch is open for business if you're vegan. She would not stop sucking my dick. Animals have better things to do than become our shit. And I only fuck vegans, which, interestingly enough, featured an intro with clips from the movie Downfall, a World War II historical often parodied on YouTube. The clip that Sakars used features Hitler and an assistant discussing something in German, which Sakars had re-subtitled, so it appears that Hitler was lamenting Sakars' incredible attractiveness and bemoaning the fact that he wasn't able to have sex with him due to his love for meat and animal products. This then proceeded into an intro which, again, involved John proclaiming that he would only be willing to perform oral sex on the viewer if they were vegan. It's worth noting that John's linguistic positioning in these affairs is somewhat interesting psychoanalytically. John doesn't offer oral sex to vegans. Most of the instances where he mentions it, he's coming from an angle of, sorry, but you'll have to be vegan, implying the viewer has already requested such an act from John, and he is issuing a stipulation in response. What this signifies psychologically, I don't know. Maybe there's someone in the audience who can tell me. What I do know, however, is that this gives John an extreme air of confidence in a way. Not many activists, vegan or otherwise, would have the balls to base a large amount of their message on, if you don't join this movement, we'll never be able to have sex. To this day, I have no idea how effective this strategy was for John. However, as time progressed, people began to take note of his strange and extremely forward style of video making, songwriting and activism. I have the urge to do something very non-vegan right now. Um, yeah. In 2015, John was featured on the TV program Tosh.0, gaining him an influx of followers. And then shortly after, his sexy surprise for adult vegans video was featured on H3H3 Productions, a YouTube channel with over 2 million subscribers. This opened the floodgates of virility to John's content. 
Most of the attention was focused around his sexy surprise video and the perceived cringe factor. And soon, John Sakar's cringe compilations became pretty widespread, some amassing views in the hundreds of thousands. It's worth noting that such an extreme level of negative attention would genuinely be enough to drive some people to clinical insanity. In some cases, this extended to threats of death and violence towards John as well as extremely abusive statements regarding his musical and artistic ability. With that in mind, it's all the more impressive that John took the negative attention and criticism in his stride, never attacking individuals or inciting witch hunts, and never complaining about the negative attention. Indeed, he expressed gratitude that people were listening to his work at all, and hoped it was enough to turn at least a small percentage of viewers vegan. While this was happening, his creative efforts became less and less built around sex and more around other fringe political ideas. I will cover these in good time, but first I'd like to talk a little bit about John as a musician. There is a genre of music known within academic circles as outsider music. Wikipedia defines this as music created by self-taught or naive musicians. I would personally expand this definition to include music recorded using unintentionally low fidelity recording techniques and music with an unprofessional sound. This does not necessarily mean that the music in question has received no musical training, simply that the work has a certain character that suggests inexperience or lack of traditional musical priorities. Famous examples of outsider music would include Daniel Johnston, that I ever knew I had a flat tire down memory lane, Viper, Yoko Woods, don't give us no bread. Grant McDonald and The Shags. I firmly believe that John Sakar's bizarre vegan anthems are deserving of inclusion in that list. And to support this position, I've done some in-depth analysis on his writing style. Example number one. <coughs> Rhythm, groove, and scansion. John is a drummer, quite a good drummer too, as evidenced in some of the videos where he plays a full set. In a Reddit Ask Me Anything thread, he states that he used to play drums in a band and learned some basic guitar skills from his bandmates. In the answer, he mentions that he doesn't know much about how to play guitar. However, in some videos, he can be seen performing relatively advanced guitar techniques, such as unison bends, using distortion to create sound effects Hello mom, hello dad, I am a vegan, don't be mad and two-handed tapping Vegan, monko, vegan, taiko, vegan, monko, vegan, taiko, vegan, monko, vegan, dad John mentions in the comments of one of his videos that he currently doesn't own a set of drums himself making his playing all the more impressive considering there'd be no way for him to regularly practice his musical foundation as a drummer becomes prominent in his performances of other instruments, and even in his lyrical scansion. For an example, I'm going to use the song My Crotch is Open for Business If You're Vegan. Before I play the tune itself, I'd like to look at the lyric structure. If you eat animal products, we're never going to get busy. If you exploit animals, my crotch is closed for business. If you are vegan, my crotch is open for business. Typically, one might be inclined to fit these words into a rhythmic structure where the first word of every sentence lines with the first beat of a bar, like so. If you eat animal products, we're never gonna get busy. If you exploit animals, my crotch is closed for business. If you are vegan, my crotch is open for business. This would be an obvious way of making the lyrics scan. Often, the beginning of the musical measures, or bars, also happen to synchronise with the individual lines of the lyrics. If I write this out in the obvious way, you can see that the downward pointing black arrows show us where the lines of lyrics start. This is one way that John Sakars could have scanned his lyrics. And at first, it seems fine. However, there are a couple of things here that feel awkward to someone well versed in lyrical scansion. Namely, the quickly delivered consonant filled phrases in bars 3 and 5 come off as quite forced and unnatural. This is where my assertion of John Sakar's musical ability starts to come into play. John probably tried these lyrics against the percussion backing and realised the problem, because in the song itself he very cleverly overcomes it by shifting the start of each line before the corresponding measure, as indicated here. If you eat animal products, we're never gonna get busy. 
If you exploit animals, my crotch is closed for business. If you are vegan, my crotch is open for business. This shows that Sakars was indeed putting time and effort into these songs. They weren't being stamped out in a machine-like recording process using stock loops and recycling lyrics. Well, m maybe the phrase go vegan, but apart from that, he was sitting down and writing these things. If you are vegan, my crotch is open for business. If you are vegan, my crotch is open for business. Harmony. John is obviously not a classically trained singer. Despite this, he successfully uses his voice to impart clear melodies and often utilizes tricks like layering the same vocal part many times to create a chorus, or voicing harmony in a non-intuitive but still musical way. He also seems to enjoy featuring other vocalists in his work and has some very interesting collaborative songs with fellow vegan activists. You can hear examples of his vocal layering on songs like Welcome to Planet Vegan, where he sings four-part harmony using suspended chords in the chorus. Another harmonically interesting work is She Would Not Stop Sucking My Dick. Not due to the vocal techniques employed, but more due to the scale used. Instead of opting for a traditional major or minor scale, John utilizes the uncommon tonality of E Phrygian, a type of scale referred to as a mode. In a normal minor scale, the song would sound like this. I was with the woman last night and she would not stop sucking my dick. <laughs> That was the melody in the more commonly used natural minor scale. Now compare that to the sound of the Phrygian mode with a slightly darker quality. The relevant note is again highlighted. I was with the woman last night and she would not stop sucking my dick. I was with the woman last night and she would not stop sucking my dick. The note is played across the whole band. The fact that it's multiple instruments playing it in tandem as opposed to just one instrument hitting the note suggests intention and premeditation of the choice. You can also hear this exact technique, a descending melodic line in the Phrygian mode in John's tune Veganism is Gay. It's quite similar. Lyrics and song themes. One might be inclined to assume John's music uniformly esoteric and occasionally sexually perverse. However, the topics of several of his songs demonstrate an extremely honest, forgiving, and frankly human ethos behind the veneer of extreme vegan confidence. As his career in music progressed, so did the care with which he delivered his message. It's interesting to note that the vegan sex anthems dwindled in number, particularly after his H3H3 H3 appearance, perhaps indicating that John had taken the many criticisms of his work on board. He instead turned his attention to campaigning for things such as socialist and communist aligned political views, LGBT plus issues, universal basic income and healthcare, as well as a lot of other related far left topics. Listening through a more recent selection of John's work also finds him spreading a message of universal love and compassion. For instance, in his video John Sakars Reads YouTube Comments Part 7, John opts to respond to abusive commenters with a song, in which he thanks them as viewers for being part of the ride that is his YouTube fame. You are total trash, you are making vegans look bad. Ooh, that tiny bulge. Oh my god, you are disgusting. He ugly as fuck. Well, you may have noticed I didn't respond to any of these comments because I thought I would respond with a song. Thank you for being the very best part of this dream. Thank you for being the very best part of this dream. While it might seem counterintuitive to address detractors by calling them friends and thanking them, John was making a pretty clever move here. By promoting love and acceptance in the face of adversity, he gave his enemies very little ammunition to fire back at him with. As far as online battles of wits go, John kinda won this one. Another song with a similar theme is If You Kill Me, I Forgive You. Instead of being aimed at a specific group of people, however, this song was more general in its intended audience. The song addresses a theoretical killer, stating that in the event of John's death at the hands of another being, he wishes no grudge or ill will and chooses to love regardless. The sentiment is genuinely beautiful and really underlines a lot about why I love John's music. It is genuine and it's matured with time to allow John many different levels of creative expression, some humorous, some poignant, some bizarre, but all very human. At this point in the video, I'd like to mention that my research on John always ended up leading me back to the same place, his personal contact details. I recalled my last video on its seat of the pants interview with homoerotic spoken word country rock artist Grant McDonald. 
The idea of interviewing John was not only appealing, but also within the realm of possibility, due to the relatively low level of engagement that his content received at the time. This time, however, I wasn't going to dive headfirst into the situation without a plan. I knew what I wanted to know about John, and what questions I had for him, so I got in touch with him via instant messenger and proposed an interview. He not only consented to a recorded interview with me, but also suggested something I'd never dreamt of. He wanted to collaboratively record a song together. What follows is the recorded interview and my subsequent musical collaboration with the enigma that is John Sackars. Tell us a little bit about your music video creation process. What do you do to, to create those videos? What order do you kind of do things in? Do you record all the music first and then just kind of synchronize perform it? I, well, as far as the video, yeah, yeah. I usually, um, I record the music first and then lip sync afterwards. But there are some videos where it's just a live performance. I, I made a series of videos where I was in the bathtub just with an acoustic guitar. Yeah. And a, a bunch of those did really well. And I, I, saw, I thought that's kind of fun because it's really uh, intimate, you know, just yeah. sitting in the bathtub with someone. So, yeah, so some, some of them are, are a live performance, but yeah, most of them are the music's recorded first and then I lip sync after. Yeah, yeah, cool. I did really like the bathtub videos. I thought, um, I, I saw the song, It's Been a Long Time Since I Got Laid. And I thought, I <laughs> yeah. thought like, not only is it funny, but it also actually takes quite a lot of guts to do oh, a song yeah, like thank that. you, thank you. And yeah. uh, well, I had the idea for the song, and then I thought, well, I better make the video now, well, in case something comes up and I have sex, because I then it can be <laughs> truthful with the song. So I, I, yeah, it was truthful at the time, you know, it had been years, and so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that was, uh, yeah, thank you. And I'm sure, you know, people can, <laughs> people can relate, so... Uh, M most definitely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, there was a, there's a... Something that I think a lot of people who are commenting in particular miss is that it strikes me as quite self-aware. It strikes me as quite like, you're not... There, there's an element, you're literally saying it's a long time since I've got laid, but also like there's kind of understanding that it's a bit of a silly way to do it and you're aware of that. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I feel... Uh that I'm aware of everything I'm doing. Uh, like some people might think like, am I socially aware? Like, do I not realize like this is making people cringe or something like that? But yeah, I know some of it is very, very silly and it does make people cringe, but then that's kind of you. This stuff that makes people cringe, part, gets a lot of views. And yeah. uh, I like to entertain people, but at the same time, they're getting seeds planted because I'm often talking about revolutionary topics uh, as far as justice for uh, humans and other animals. Yeah, and so like you're you're using the weirdness of the really weird stuff to to hook people in, and th mm -hmm. then once you have their attention, you can kind of say, well, these are actually the things I believe in, and this is this is what I'm really trying to do here. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I feel that weirdness is like that's one of my talents, I guess, is I'm not afraid to look like a weirdo because I don't consider myself to be really like a good singer or musician. Uh, not very good looking or anything, but I, I can be a weirdo. So hey, you know, we always use our talents whatever we can do, so... That's it. And and with your with the music that you make, it's... I mean, you don't have to be technically extremely competent to play it, but it's still... The thing I like about it is that it's still music. It's still obviously written intentionally, orchestrated, orchestrated intentionally. And, and there's a, a real element of musicality to it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, I used to play drums in bands. I, I started playing drums when I was 16. Oh. And uh, I, yeah, and I played drums in heavy metal bands for years. Cool. And so I was around some really good guitar players. Yeah. And uh, so then one day, uh, I was living in a band, like in a house, all the musicians we were living together. Yeah. And the guitar player, uh, he sold me one of his guitars and he taught me some lessons. And so I learned how to, you know, play basic chords and bar chords. And then I started to write songs. And right from the beginning, my songs that I wrote uh, were about social justice issues. They started out mainly about animal rights, but then I got into other other social justice issues too. And I, I rant against capitalism a lot yep. because yeah. I want to have a world where everyone's needs are met. Yes. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
you know, with this, I, I, I've known for years that a lot of jobs aren't necessary. Mm. And so now with this pandemic going on, we're, we're kind of learning, yeah, actually a lot of jobs weren't necessary and a lot of people could have been working from home and we could chill out a little bit. We have this technology. We don't have to have everyone working 40 plus hours a week. Let's mm. have more time for making music and reading books and hugging trees and whatever you like to do. Yeah, and with, with automation on the rise, the number of jobs that actually need humans to be doing them are going to go down and down and down and down and down. Yeah. On the topic of playing drums, I, I had a few questions here and you've already answered one of them for me, which was, when did you start doing music? You already told me you were 16. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about yeah, that. I, I, sure. Well, I, let's see. I At the time, there was a, a music store in downtown Niagara Falls, Ontario, Canada. Mm. And I went there and I saw there was a, a, a woman who gave drum lessons. And at the time, I didn't have drums, but I was very motivated to learn. Hmm. So I told her I don't have drums. And she said, well, how are you going to practice what I teach you? And I said, don't worry, I'll air drum. <laughs> and so she said, okay, and because I was very motivated. She took me on as a student. She taught me a beat. I went home, and I just air drummed and practiced all week. Cool. And I came back on the drum set, and I just nailed it. And she was very impressed, like, how I got so good not even having drums to play. But, you know, if you're really determined, uh, you can air drum or just bang on pillows or something. And... Uh, yeah, that's yeah, and then, a really cool story, actually. Thank you. Sometimes, like, for over five years now, I've been traveling around couch surfing. So sometimes during my travels, I would visit with someone who has a drum set. So I'll just sit down and just play whatever, just make up some beats and, roll, and drum rolls. Right. And then record it and later on use it for songs. That's, and yeah. so that, those, those, that, that drum set in that, from that song, like, sometimes I'll even reuse a beat for two or three different songs. And sometimes I'll copy and paste and, like, just take like take the same drum beat but just, just arrange it differently so and uh it's like you so there's several different yeah. drum sets from different places like there's an electronic drum set from when i was in florida mm. and uh yeah uh, so yeah I, I don't have drums right now because i i am like a houseless drifter you know like a yeah. transient so i just live out of a back of a backpack i'm always i'm not never when i say houseless i'm not like staying out on the street i i'm always staying with friends and yeah and family so but you're not. So yeah, I don't have a drum set. Yeah, you're not renting a specific place and and. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If I was, then maybe I could have a drum set again. That'll be yeah. That'll be cool. So I suppose you just got your air drums for now. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, air drums for now. Uh, yeah. Do you have any instruments that you carry around with you, or a pe special pair of sticks, or? Yeah, I don't have any a uh, special pair of sticks. I have uh, I have a guitar. Cool. That I got from a guitar player friend. Uh, nice. Just a, I don't know. You put your cheap V. One, but I like the uh, design on the pick guard. Oh, so sorry. I like the design on the pick guard. That sort of splotchy, red mottled color. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just fooling around with some paints and. Oh yeah, yeah you, thank you you painted it yourself. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. What would be maybe five artists that you felt were really influential to just specifically the kind of music you make, for the purposes of. Uh, me and also the audience understanding a bit more about where you're coming from with your music okay, and sure. where those I, sounds originate well one band I, I, I we used to play some of their songs a band called Alice in Chains yeah I know and, Alice in Chains uh, yeah yeah them and I, I get introduced to like drop deep tuning so sometimes I do that in the guitar and make it sound he heavy um, another band I like is uh, Faith No More mm -hmm. and how they have a variety of different styles yep. um Hmm. Well, Nirvana for sure a big influence. Uh, cool. One of their songs, yeah. I sort of, I sort of ripped off one of their songs. I there's one song called "You Owned My Vegan Dick," where I'm, okay. uh, I I haven't heard that, that one. one. That's another one where I'm in the bathtub. Yeah. And it's got a couple chords that are are totally from that song, like "Something in the Way," I think it's called. Something in the way. And uh, yeah, I'll, um... so when I first learning started learning guitar, it was mainly like trying to learn some Nirvana songs. So they're definitely a big influence for me cool yeah and um well, that... there's there's a few so it's it's a lot of heavy heavier stuff yeah my next question was um how do you feel about your current level of success as a songwriter as a video maker as a youtuber how do you feel about it yeah i i think it's I, i'm very very grateful i uh, you know that that I know if I write a song and upload it, that some people are going to check it out, and I'm not just like singing to a wall or something. So yeah, I'm very grateful to everyone who checks out my work, and uh, and 
I'm also kind of grateful that I'm not super duper duper famous because, you know, I'm an activist and like I'm speaking out against the system of capitalism and I'm speaking about loving everyone. And there's a long history of people getting shot for talking about all the stuff that I'm talking about, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> like lots of activi- activists. And so, you know, I sometimes I think, hey, if I was really super famous and, you know, for instance, and I've, I've made several songs about, uh, rent, how, about how housing should be free yes. and saying rent is theft. And, you know, I always wonder, am I going to piss off the wrong bunch of landlords and they're going to kill me or something? I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, so it's, it's nice to not be super famous and not have all the big problems that come with that. Yeah, yeah. And also, I suppose it would feel kind of, um, it would feel kind of a bit disingenuous if you were like extremely making huge amounts of money off it, but also yeah. having that message of, of, of essentially a, a very socialist or communist message of yeah. not having those massive uh, wealth gaps between people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it keeps it more real. Uh... Appearing on the H3H3 podcast, mm-hmm. I noticed that was, that seemed to have been the big thing. Like, that was the big yeah. influx of, of attention to your channel. Is that right? Oh yeah, I and I noticed that. I've, I'm very grateful when that happens. When uh, I've like a really success, like a YouTube channel that, with a lot of subscribers, when I uh, when they feature some of my work in one of their videos, because yeah, all this, like, I check comments on YouTube every day, and sometimes there's uh, like an explosion of comments, and I'm I'm thinking someone must have shared something. Yeah. And so yeah, when that happens, I got a lot of exposure to my channel. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful. Even if people want to poke fun at me, I'm fine with that because, you know, I poke fun at myself. And uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't mind at all. It's all done in fun, you know. I don't feel like anyone's trying to be mean to me. Mm. And if you're poking fun at yourself, I mean, it's, that's the, it's the old dealing with a bully thing, right? Yeah. If yeah. you're not bothered by people making fun of you, then it's not any fun to make fun of you anymore. Well, maybe that's why it's not fun, because maybe I think people probably get it that nothing bothers me, uh, so... Yeah, and you take it in your stride. (laughs) If they're really trying to bother me, then they're not succeeding, so... All right, Um, so my last question for you that I can think of is where do you want to go in the future with your music, with your activism, with uh, just your message in general? Where would you like it to take you? Yeah, thank you. I... Well, I, I would like to um, use my platform to help lift up less heard voices. And so I've had lots of fun, for instance, re- uh, recording uh, women and non-binary people. And uh, so I, I've already seen my face on YouTube uh, enough. Like I, yeah. I still like writing songs, but if I could, anytime I could get a chance to collaborate with someone, yep. I don't, I, it could be totally behind the scenes. I, I don't mind just like helping them to record their work. Yeah, so yeah. I, I'd love to spend more of my time helping to uh, yeah lift up lesser voices, help like marginalized people get their message out there, cool. and um, so that's that's what I would like to do more so in the future. I, for instance, a few years ago I was visited Chicago and there were a couple of artists there who I I just helped them. I uh, and I, I I like recorded the music and then did the video and I added subtitles and everything and it cool. and it was lots of fun. Uh, so I. You know, I've developed these, you know, skills throughout the years. I've worked to my own stuff, so I'd like to help other people. All right, cool. Great. Well, um, those are all the questions I had. Um, just want to thank you for your time today, John. It's been really insightful sure, getting to talk you, to you. Thank, thank you very much, Finn, and I look forward to uh, yeah hearing more of your music and hmm. and seeing uh, seeing the video that you're making. And I, I'm excited that we're collaborating on a song now. Yes, that's very good. I've um on that note, actually, I've finished doing all the beds for it. I finished doing the guitars, basses, drum. I walked outside into the world. The sun was shining bright. It was seven in the morning and I'd been asleep all night. Dreaming of a world with no oppression anywhere. No one hoarding resources and we're all happy to share. One day I would like to visit planet John One day I would like to help him sing this song We'll be drinking green smoothies 
in our swimming togs, lying in the sun. I walked outside into the world, feeling quite all right. It was seven in the morning, and I'd been asleep all night. Dreaming of a world where every being is free. We share all the resources in a moneyless society. Best part.